Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the Archfey Demonologist, Tasha the Witch Queen. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what builds we'll be covering next. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Tasha the Witch Queen is a planeswalker with 4 loyalty that can be our commander, costs 3 a black and a blue, and has the following abilities. Her passive lets us, whenever we cast a spell we don't own, create a 3-3 black demon creature token. Her plus 1 draws us a card, then, for each opponent, exiles an instant or sorcery from their graveyard with a page counter on it. And her minus 3 lets us cast a spell in exile with a page counter on it without paying its mana cost. So, right out of the gate, we can see that Tasha is sporting a mid-size CMC, a decent amount of starting loyalty for her cost, and a set of abilities that focus around casting spells we don't own for value, incentivizing us to steal our opponent's spells for fun and profit. Looking at her passive first, it serves as the primary payoff for her spell theft focused playstyle, allowing us to steadily increase our board presence as we cast our opponent's cards, providing Tasha with a wall of summoned bodies to screen attacks for her as we continually rob our opponent's spells and turn them against them, which goes a long way to shore up her vulnerability as a planeswalker commander. Her plus one then works nicely as a repeatable source of card advantage and graveyard hate, generating us an extra card per turn and removing up to three cards from our opponent's graveyards as we do so. And while yes, this is only limited to instants and sorceries, there are still plenty of powerful targets to hit that we'd rather not have our opponents have access to from their grave, or alternatively, that we want to have access to instead. Which then leads nicely into Tasha's final ability, which lets us cast a spell we exiled with her plus one for free. And while this is undoubtedly a powerful ability, allowing us to cast our opponent's most powerful instants and sorceries from their bins at no cost, it should be noted that we'll have to jump through a few hoops to get the most use out of it. From getting a valid card into the bin, spending a turn to use Tasha's plus one to exile it in the first place, then using a whopping three loyalty from her starting four to actually cast that spell, making it an ability that, while potent, will need some setup and will need to use sparingly. So, now that we've broken down Tasha's abilities, it appears that her primary game plan is to get us extra bodies on board as we steal and cast our opponent's spells with her passive, providing us with extra card advantage and even more theft with her activated abilities, making her the perfect candidate to helm a Demir spell theft focused build, which will aim not only to take our opponent's resources away from them but also turn them against their owners as well. Luckily for us, Demir has no shortage of effects that let us steal our opponent's spells away from them, giving us a wide selection of effects that let us pilfer their resources from their decks, hands, and graveyards to ensure that there's nowhere they can hide their spells from us. And while some of these effects require our creatures to get in for damage or that we pay for the spell in question with mana outside our colors, this build has a number of ways to make our creatures evasive to ensure they connect, as well as means to produce mana outside our colors to ensure that our spell thievery can go on unhindered. So, now that we know what this human turned archfey is capable of, let's turn her considerable skills loose upon our opponents. While her aliases are many and her history is quite sordid, her power is undeniable, rivaling even the most powerful demon lords of the Forgotten Realms. So she should have no problems dealing with any upstart planeswalkers that dare cross her, and defeating them with their own arsenal of spells to make it all the more amusing. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Our first creature entrants join us in the CMC3 slot, those being Night Vale Spectre and Thief of Sanity. Night Vale Spectre is a 2-3 flyer that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, exiles a top card of their library and lets us play it. Its combination of built-in evasion and on-damage theft allowing us to easily and repeatedly proc our commander, along with the added benefit of allowing us to play any lands we exile with it to make both our land drops and get access to our opponent's colors for future spells we steal. Thief of Sanity is a 2-2 flyer that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, lets us look at the top 3 cards of their deck, exiling one face down and sending the rest to their graveyard, letting us cast the exiled card for as long as it remains exiled with mana of any color, giving us another evasive damage theft effect that, while it may not hit lands, does fill our opponent's bins for Tasha to take advantage of, and still lets us play cards that have been exiled with it even after it's been dealt with for some additional reliability. Some not so evasive spell thieves then join our ranks as we move deeper into this slot with Karu Mind Eater and Anashi Moon Sage's Scion. 
Karu Mind Eater is a 1-3 with Menace that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, exiles a card from their hand face down and lets us play it. It's Menace not being the most reliable form of evasion, but its ability to pillage a card directly from our opponent's hands being too good to pass up, while our evasion granting sources can make it considerably more reliable. Nashi is a 3-2 with Ninjutsu for 3 and a black that, whenever he deals combat damage to a player, exiles a top card of each player's library, allowing us to play one of them until end of turn, and paying life equal to its CMC instead of mana to cast it. His Ninjutsu allowing him to get in for the first hit reliably, and his ability allowing us to easily cast our opponent's spells in exchange for life, or at worst get land drops from outside our color pie instead if we don't have the life to spare. And finally, we close out this slot with Burnished Heart, a 2-2 we can pay 3 in sack to put two basic lands from our deck into play tapped, serving as a reliable form of land base ramp in our colors to speed up our mana base and get to Tasha and our other high CMC spells that much faster. Moving on to the CMC4 slot, we start off with a trio of spell thieves in the form of Hostage Taker, Intellect Devourer, and Gaunti Lord of Luxury. Hostage Taker is a 2-3 that, when it ETBs, exiles target creature or artifact until it leaves the field and lets us cast that card for as long as it remains exiled for mana of any color, making it both a removal spell and a theft effect, reducing our opponent's board states and then increasing our own. Intellect Devourer is a 2-4 that, when it ETBs, has each opponent exile a card from their hand until it leaves play and lets us play those cards with mana of any color stripping resources straight from our opponent's grips as soon as it comes down and effectively giving us three extra cards to play with when doing so. Gaunti is a 2-3 with Death Touch that, whenever they ETB, let us look at the top four cards of target opponent's library, exiling one face down and sending the rest to the bottom, allowing us to play the exiled card for as long as it remains exiled with mana of any color. Initially giving us a decent way to dig through our opponent's decks for a good spell to steal, which we can play at our leisure even if Gaunti's dealt with, and leaving behind a Death Toucher that can deter attacks away from Tasha as a bonus. Then we close out this slot with some less traditional theft effects in the form of Draugr Necromancer and Karu Spell Snatcher. Draugr Necromancer is a 4-4 that, whenever an opponent's creature would die, exiles it with an Ice Counter instead, allowing us to cast creatures exiled with Ice Counters and using Snow Mana as though it were mana of any color to do so. Our lack of Snow Lands admittedly making it a bit harder to use, but our various any color rocks and means to play our opponent's lands still making it worth playing, even if just to use as a silver bullet against graveyard focused builds. Karu Spell Snatcher is a 3-3 with more for 4 and double blue that, when it's turned to face up, counters target spell and exiles it, allowing us to cast it for free as long as it remains exiled, making it an expensive but potent means to snatch a powerful spell from our opponents as they cast it from right under their noses. Now entering the CMC 5 slot, we have another pair of evasive spell thieves joining our gang with Dazzling Sphinx and Fiend of Shadows. Dazzling Sphinx is a 4-5 flyer that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, exiles cards from their library until we exile an instant or sorcery, allowing us to cast it for free and sending all other cards exiled this way to the bottom of their deck, serving as a decent sized evasive body that will always dig for something we can steal from our opponents and then cast it for free, all of which fits perfectly with our game plan. Fiend of Shadows is a 3-3 flyer that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, has that player exile a card from their hand and allows us to cast that card for as long as it remains exiled, which we can also regenerate by sacking a human, giving us an evasive means to steal cards directly from our opponent's hands that we can occasionally protect if we're able to acquire humans from our opponents. Fallen Shinobi then joins us as a non-evasive spell thief. Being a 5-4 that, when it deals combat damage to a player, exiles the top two cards of their deck and lets us play them for free until the end of the turn, as well as having ninjutsu for two a blue and a black, easily allowing it to get in initially off the back of our other evasive creatures, and continuing to get in thanks to our evasion sources to plunder our opponent's decks for free spells turn after turn. Then we close out this slot with a pair of grave robbers, namely Author of Shadows and Haven Gold Lich. Author of Shadows is a 3-3 that, when it ETBs, exiles all cards from our opponent's graveyards, letting us choose one from among them and cast it for as long as it remains exiled with mana of any color, making it a non-theme form of graveyard hate that, while it can hurt our own graveyard theft effects, is still good to have access to in order to combat against graveyard-focused builds. Haven Golich is a 4-4 that lets us pay 1 to cast target creature from a graveyard this turn, also letting it gain all the activated abilities of the cast creature until end of turn as well, providing our build with a repeatable means to cast our opponent's creatures from their bin or our own instead if we lack the necessary colors. Closing in on the end now, the CMC6 slot brings us its two legendary Demir entrants, Rexol the Risen Deep and Xanathar Guild Kingpin. 
Rexel is a 5-8 with both Island and Swamp Walk that, when he deals combat damage to a player, lets us cast an instant or sorcery from their grave for free and then exiles it. His two land walks allowing him to get in for damage fairly reliably to continue propagating our spell pilfering. Xanathar is a 5-6 that, on our upkeep, has us choose target opponent, preventing them from casting spells until the end of the turn and letting us look at and play cards off the top of their deck for mana of any color until end of turn as well. Simultaneously turning our opponent's top deck into a second hand for ourselves and hobbling their ability to do anything about it when we do so. And finally, reaching the CMC 7 slot in our last trio of creatures, we have Brainstealer Dragon, Elder Brain, and Silent Blade Oni. Brainstealer Dragon is a 6 6 flyer that, on our end step, exiles the top card of each opponent's library and lets us play those cards for as long as they remain exiled for mana of any color. As well as, whenever a non land permanent an opponent owns enters the battlefield under our control, having its owner lose life equal to its CMC. Not only effectively drawing us 3 cards per turn off our opponent's decks, but also turning every permanent spell we cast from both its own and our other theft effects into burn to quickly chew through our opponent's life totals, all while being a huge evasive beat stick to boot. Elder Brain is another 6-6, this time with Menace, that, whenever it attacks a player, exiles all cards from that player's hand and then has them draw that many cards, allowing us to play and cast cards exiled this way for as long as they remain exiled with mana of any color. It's on attack forced wheel being incredibly disruptive to our opponent's game plans, not only preventing them from keeping their cards in hand for long, but also forcing them to use them immediately or risk having them used against them later. Silent Blade Oni is a 6-5 with Ninjutsu for 4, a blue and a black that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, lets us look at that player's hand and cast a spell from it for free, making it a near-perfect culmination of our on-damage theft effects that simultaneously rips a card from our opponent's hands and lets us cast it at no cost in one fell swoop, made all the easier by its ability to Ninjutsu itself in as our other evasive creatures crack in. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Moving right into the CMC2 slot, we start off with a whole slew of counter spells to disrupt our opponent's casting as much as possible. With Counterspell being capable of countering any spell, Arcane Denial countering any spell and having the spell's owner draw two while we draw one on the next upkeep, and Disdainful Stroke countering any spell of CMC4 or greater, each serving as cheap means to hamper our opponent's plays and sending the fizzled spells to the grave so that our commander and other spell theft effects can snatch them up for our use. The trio of creature removal spells, Infernal Grasp, go for the throat and cast down, then join our removal suite, all of which destroy target creature, the first costing two life to cast, the second being limited to non-artifacts, and the third being limited to non-legendaries, again giving us dirt cheap means to keep the board clear of threat and, once in the bin, more spells for us to steal. And then we end this slot with Siphon Insight, which lets us look at the top two cards of target opponent's deck, exiling one face down while sending the other to the bottom of the deck and letting us play the exiled card for as long as it remains exiled with mana of any color, while also having flashback for one a blue and a black, making it a cheap means to set up our commander twice per game before she even hits the board. Then entering the CMC3 slot, we have another pair of counter spells joining our removal lineup with Didn't Say Please and Psychic Strike both of which counter target spell and mill the spell's controller for 3 and 2 respectively. Again, providing our build with even more spell disruption with the added bonus of adding a few more cards into our opponent's bin for our commander or other graveyard theft effects to take advantage of. And finally, skipping to the CMC5 slot, we have our last instant, Gale's Redirection, which lets us exile target spell and roll a d20, adding the exiled spell CMC to the result, on a 1 through 14 allowing us to cast the exiled spell as long as it remains exiled with mana of any color, and on a 15 plus doing the same but allowing us to cast it for free instead, effectively serving as another counter spell that this time not only blanks the spell but lets us cast it later with a bigger and bigger chance to do so for free as the game progresses and bigger spells are cast. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Moving straight into the CMC2 slot, we have its pair of spell-stealing entrants with Extract Brain and Predator's Hour. Extract Brain is an X spell that has target opponent reveal X cards from their hand and allowing us to cast a spell from among them for free serving as a decent way to snipe out powerful cards from our opponent's grips for us to use, potentially quite cheaply if they're running low on cards in hand. Predator's Hour, until end of turn, gives all our creatures menace and, whenever they deal combat damage to a player, exiles the top card of that opponent's deck and lets us play that card for as long as it remains exiled with mana of any color, cheaply tacking on an additional theft effect to our already evasive spell thieves, and even adding in some additional evasion to make them even harder to intercept. 
Then proceeding to the CMC3 slot, we have its lone entrant with Mnemonic Betrayal, which exiles itself when we cast it and exiles all cards from all our opponent's graveyards, allowing us to cast those cards with mana of any color until end of turn, returning any card still exiled by it back to their owner's graveyard at the end of the turn. Effectively impulse drawing our opponent's entire graveyards for an insane amount of card advantage and card selection that, while temporary, can generate us a lot of value from both the spells we cast and the tokens we create with our commander. It's then on to the CMC4 slot, where we start off with a pair of cards that rob spells from our opponent's decks, Stolen Goods and Talents of the Telepath. The former exiling cards from target opponent's deck until we hit a non-land card and letting us cast it for free until end of turn, and the latter exiling the top 7 cards of target opponent's deck instead, letting us cast an instant or sorcery from among them for free, or two instead if we have two instants and or sorceries in our bin to trigger spell mastery, sending all the other exiled cards to the graveyard making them both excellent sources of free spells to trigger our commander, with the latter even setting up the grave further for her to steal even more spells later down the line. Another pair of theft effects then get added into our arsenal with Covetous Urge and Memory Plunder. Covetous Urge has target play reveal their hand, then lets us exile target non-land card from their hand or graveyard, allowing us to cast it as long as it remains exiled with mana of any color, serving as another means to steal resources directly from our opponent's hands, with the added benefit of allowing us to hit their graves instead if they have nothing in hand worth taking. Memory Plunder lets us cast an instant or sorcery from an opponent's graveyard for free, requiring a bit more patience and setup to get the most use out of, but potentially allowing us to steal our opponent's most powerful non-permanent spells to use ourselves after they've used it or we force them to send it to their graveyard, often well below its casting cost. And then wrapping up this slot, we have Siphon Mind, which has each opponent discard a card and then lets us draw a card for each card discarded this way, giving us a reliable way to replenish our hands that also fills up our opponent's bins in the process, which again our commander and other grave robbers can put to good use. And lastly, skipping to the CMC6 slot and our last sorcery, we have Xander's Pact, which has each opponent exile the top card of their deck and lets us cast any spell from among them by spending a life equal to its CMC, in addition to having Casualty 2 easily allowing us to get a maximum of 6 spells off our opponent's decks provided we have the life to spend and the extra body to sack, alongside the accompanying tokens created by our commander to build up our board presence even faster. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Again, skipping right to the CMC2 slot, we have the Rogue Class, a class which, at level 1, whenever a creature we control deals combat damage to a player, exiles the top card of their deck face down, at level 2, which costs 1, a blue and a black, gives all our creatures menace, and at level 3, which costs 2, a blue and a black, lets us play cards exiled with it with mana of any color, making it very similar to Predator's Hour, taking longer to come online but not being limited to one turn, making it still very much worth running. Then the first half of the CMC3 slot brings us Court of Cunning, which makes us the Monarch when it ETBs and, on our upkeep, mills any number of target players for 2 or 10 instead if we're the Monarch, serving as a source of card advantage that our evasive creatures can easily get back if taken, and continual mill that our commander can certainly put to use to steal even more spells. The latter half of this slot then adds in King Narfi's Betrayal, a saga whose first chapter mills all players for four, then exiles a creature or planeswalker from each graveyard, and whose second and third chapters allow us to cast the exiled cards with mana of any color, providing us with yet another graveyard theft effect that can even set itself up as it comes down. And finally, reaching the CMC5 slot in our last enchantment, we have Patient Rebuilding, which, on our upkeep, mills target opponent for three and has us draw a card for each land milled this way, providing continual card advantage and mill, both of which our deck can put to good use. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. It's going to be mostly ramp in this category, starting off in the CMC1 slot with Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble. The former tapping for two colorless and the latter letting us pay two, tap it in sackets to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, each providing our build with cheap and efficient means to grow our mana base and get to our bigger spells faster. Then entering the CMC2 slot, we'll quickly run down our mana rock collection, leading off with Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Demir Signet, which we can pay one in tap to generate both our colors, Talisman of Dominance, which we can tap for a colorless or either of our colors instead if we take a damage, Felwar Stone, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce. Cold Steel Heart, which comes into play tapped and has a select a color when it ETBs, which we can tap it for. Prismatic Lens, which taps for a colorless and we can pay one and tap it for a mana of any color. And Mind Stone, which we can tap for a colorless or pay one, tap it and sack it to draw a card. 
all giving us cheap means to speed up and fix our mana base, with some of our rocks even tapping for colors outside our color pie to more easily cast our opponent's spells if needed. We'll then move away from rocks and onto evasion granting equipment to close out this slot with Mask of Riddles and Winged Boots. Mask of Riddles is an equipment that equips for two, gives the equipped creature fear, and, when it deals combat damage to a player, draws us a card. Serving as a fairly reliable source of evasion to suit up our non-evasive spell thieves with, and even adding in some card advantage on top of it as a nice bonus. Winged Boots is another equipment, this time equipping for one and granting the equipped creature flying and ward four. This time adding protection alongside its evasion to allow our creatures to sail over blockers and prevent our opponents from dealing with them easily. The CMC3 slot then brings us back on the Mana Rock plan, beginning with Coalition Relic, which we can either tap for any color or to put a charge counter on it, removing all charge counters from itself on our next main one to generate a man of any color, Component Pouch, which we can tap to roll a d20, putting a component counter on it on a result of 1 through 9 or 2 instead on a result of 10 through 20, which we can then tap and remove a counter from it to generate 2 mana of different colors, Replicating Ring, which taps for any color and gains a night counter on each of our upkeeps, removing all of them once it has eight or more to create eight token replicated rings which tap for any color as well. Skyclave Relic, which is indestructible, taps for any color and can be kicked for three to create two tap token copies of itself when it ETBs. And Decanter of Endless Water, which taps for any color and removes our maximum hand size. Every single one allowing us to tap for any colors to again more easily allow us to cast our opponent's spells, with the majority also being able to tap for multiple mana to speed up our mana base even more. Moving deeper into this slot, we then have Chaos Wand, which lets us pay for and tap it to exile cards off the top of target opponent's deck until we hit an instant or sorcery, letting us cast it for free and sending all other cards exiled this way back to the bottom of their owner's deck, giving us a means to dig through and steal our opponent's cards from their decks turn after turn, provided we have the mana to pump into it. Then we close out this slot and our artifacts with a pair of equipment, Whisper Silk Cloak and Whisper Steel Dagger. Whisper Silk Cloak is an equipment that equips for two and grants the equipped creature Shroud and makes it unblockable, making it a near-perfect means to ensure that our creatures can get in for damage while simultaneously being protected from most of our opponent's attempts to remove them. Whisper Steel Dagger is another equipment, this time equipping for three, giving the equipped creature plus two plus zero, and, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, lets us cast a creature from their graveyard until end of turn with man of any color. Working nicely alongside our evasive creatures and sources of evasion to continually grave rob our opponents turn after turn. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our planeswalkers. Skipping all the way to the CMC5 slot, we have our only other planeswalker outside our commander, Ashiok Nightmare Muse, who has 5 loyalty and the following abilities. Their plus 1 creates a 2-3 nightmare token that, whenever it attacks or blocks, exalts the top 2 cards of each opponent's library. Their minus 3 bounces target non-land permanent back to its owner's hand and then has that player exile a card from hand. And their minus 7 lets us cast up to 3 face-up exiled cards our opponents own for free providing us with a steady stream of bodies to both protect themselves and our commander, permanent removal in a pinch, and a powerful ult that allows us to steal up to three of our opponent's spells for free, which is relatively easy to reach considering Ashiok's high starting loyalty. That covers our Planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. Starting with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Exotic Orchard, which taps for any color a land our opponent controls would be able to produce, Sunken Hollow, which comes into play tapped unless we control an island or swamp, taps are either of our colors and is considered an island and a swamp. Choked Estuary, which comes into play tapped unless we reveal an island or swamp and taps are either of our colors. Shipwreck Marsh, which comes into play tapped unless we control two plus lands and taps are either of our colors. Tainted Isle, which taps for a colorless or either of our colors instead if we control a swamp. Temple of Deceit, which comes into play tapped, taps for either of our colors and scries one when it ETBs. Myriad Landscape, which comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless and we can pay two, tap it and sack it to put two of the same basic land from our deck into play tapped. And finally, Maestro's Theater and Obscura Storefront, both of which sack themselves when they ETB to put a basic island or swamp from our deck into play tapped and gain us a life. Then moving on to our utility lands, we have our only two entrance with Rogue's Passage and Access Tunnel, both of which tap for a colorless and we can tap to make target creature unblockable, the former costing four to do so and the latter costing only three but being limited to three power or less creatures, providing us with even more ways to grant our creatures evasion to make sure they can crack in for damage and pilfer our opponent's resources as they do so. And finally, we're running 12 islands and 12 swamps as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. 
This deck currently has 20 creatures, 11 instants, 8 sorceries, 4 enchantments, 19 artifacts, 2 planeswalkers including our commander, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 35 cards that allow us to cast our opponent's spells, 6 cards that force our opponents to mill or discard, and 5 cards that grant our creatures evasion. Providing us with plenty of ways to appropriate our opponent's cards to use against them, alongside a handful of ways to fill up their bins to enable our graveyard spell thievery, as well as means to make our less stealthy spell thieves evasive so they can continue their larceny unimpeded. For general deck stats, we have 16 ramp sources, 5 card draw sources, 12 targeted removal sources, and 0 board wipes. Our ramp being high to ensure we have plenty of mana to cast our commander and non-free spells we steal from our opponents as quickly as possible, and our draw and wipes being low as we'll have plenty of opportunities to steal them from our opponents as needed. Looking at our mana curve, we have 2 1 drops, 19 2 drops, 18 3 drops, 10 4 drops, 9 5 drops, 3 6 drops, and 3 7 drops leaving us with a mid-weight curve that aims to ramp hard early to get us access to our commander ASAP if it's safe, or instead fuel our spell pilfering to stockpile cards to cast later when it's safe to bring her on board. Currently, this deck is valued at $64.88, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Psychic Intrusion, Diluvian Primordial, and Arvinox the Mind Flail would all make solid additions to allow us to steal even more resources away from our opponents, while Rod of Absorption may be a bit trickier to use as it conflicts with our commander, but can still get us a decent amount of free spells the longer it sticks around. For upgrades, Praetor's Grasp is a powerful tutor and spell theft effect that allows us to search up our opponent's most powerful cards directly from their deck to use against them. Cunning Rhetoric punishes our opponents by stealing cards off the top of their deck whenever they attack us or our commander, and Mind's Violation lets us steal and cast a free spell each turn that ignores timing restrictions as our opponents cast their own spells. And finally, Chromatic Lantern makes for a superb way to give us access to all colors to ensure we always have the right kind of mana on hand to cast our opponent's non-free non-any color mana spells, with the added benefit of not breaking the bank unlike some of our other builds last upgrade suggestions. That said, if you have too much money and the urge to spend it, you can always upgrade it to its masterpiece printing if you're willing to fork over the price of an entire set booster box and then some. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to thank all of you for keeping the channel growing despite me taking a holiday and breaking the 6.3k milestone while I was away. Thank you as always for the continued support. Secondly, regarding the 5k giveaway, I'll be making a video announcing the winner for that soon, hopefully by next week, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. Then moving on to our upcoming builds, with both Commander decks for Dominaria United being previewed on August 18th, I'll be aiming to get a pre-con upgrade guide for at least one of them by the 27th, and the other by the following week, with new non-precon builds for Dominaria United starting on September 10th, so be sure to stay tuned for those in the following weeks. And finally, before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to check out the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut-rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one, folks, and stay safe.